Ashley Young here, iHeartRadio. Once again, we are at South by Southwest, Austin, Texas, 2018. DJ Heliella, king of the ATX streets. But we're still talking about this Netflix series, Rapture. I was just telling Sasha Jenkins right here, he's one of the executive producers. He did uh, direct the Nas and Davies episode about how I, growing up, was a behind the scene, behind the music nerd. <laughs> so I will be obsessed with everyone focused on this film. First off, Sasha, can you tell us why did you all decide to do this? Like, why did you decide to tell the story and why these specific rappers? Well, before all this, I was a music journalist for many years. Yeah, I had my own music publications like Ego Trip Magazine. I was also the music editor at Vibe Magazine back when you guys were probably, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when No yeah. Limit was hot, you know, you guys were okay. probably kindergarten eight, eight. or something. Third grade? Yeah, Third grade. <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> so as someone who has been telling stories in this sort of world for a long time, and then before that, growing up in New York during the golden age, before there was a music industry, growing up with the culture, I have been someone who's been involved since day one. And so these stories are vibrant and they're important. And for the longest time, I'd seen people writing stories about hip hop. But if you don't understand the environment from which it comes, because hip hop is a reflection of the environment. So you can enjoy hip hop and you can, you know, whatever, shake your ass, but if you don't really understand where it's coming from, you're not getting the full nutrition from what hip hop has to offer. And hip hop has given me a lot of nutrition. You know, I have been, you know, working in hip hop as a, a writer, director, whatever for 25 years yeah. now. So it's changed my life. You know, I grew up with, you know, Nas and I went to the same mm -hmm. junior high school. I met Havoc from Mob Deep writing graffiti on the side of a train. So for me, all of this stuff now, to be able to have had the experience that I had as a kid who was innocent, who had knew nothing about what would happen with money and all these opportunities, to be able to transition into that world and tell those stories is something that I guess came very naturally to me, but something I take very seriously. And so a few years ago, I did a film called Fresh Dressed, which is about the history of hip hop fashion. That wound up on Netflix, and once that wound up on Netflix, it must have behind the scenes did okay, and so the door was open for us to pitch us being Mass Appeal, which is I'm a partner in, in the company, which Mass Appeal started out as a magazine, and now we do film and television and music and everything else. So, so on the st strength of the success of Fresh Dress, that opened doors for us at Netflix, and then we pitched the series, and you know, it, it, it's a very diverse range of artists because Netflix is an incredible platform mm -hmm. that reaches people the world over and so now hip hop you know the, the language of hip hop might have started in New York but there are so many regional dialects around the world yeah. it's very broad so we wanted to have a pretty broad representation of where hip hop was today knowing that we had the world and beyond watching us now besides your hometown affiliation what was it about Nas and Dave Beast that you wanted to tell their story well the Nas story has been told few times, right? There's a film called Time is Illmatic, which I think is a great film. So the challenge was, how do you tell a Nas story that is different from what already exists? So myself, Nas, and Dave East are pretty much in the same neighborhood, right? And so I realized that by showing the Nas and Dave East relationship, by looking at Dave East now, it's like looking at Nas 20, 25 years ago. I'm not saying they're, you know, I'm not saying they're the same artists, but in terms of where they come from and things that they've dealt with from public school systems to drugs to everything else, Davies is still in the hood and still has friends in the same hood that we pretty much all came up in. So by looking at Davies, it's almost like taking a time machine back and looking at where Nas was 25 years ago. And by Davies having this opportunity to have a mentor like Nas, in Nas, he can see where maybe he might go in 10, 15. And so, you know, hip hop has become very disposable, you know, um, because there's money involved, it's easier when you put things in boxes, right? Because then people know where to find it so they can press a button and spend money. But what has got, what's been lost in hip hop is the intergenerational conversation. Because like, oh, that's an old ass man, you don't know shit, <laughs> you know? All these young boys don't know what they're doing. But any great culture, if you look at Asian culture, you look at African culture, you look at world culture, it's not just based on what's hot. Any culture that has any value is based on history and how history continues to improve upon itself. 
So I wanted to do an episode that represented that, that represented like, it's not just like the old man saying that they're whack or the young guy saying the old man is whack. It's like, no, here's a, a seasoned artist, an artist on come up from a similar neighborhood, similar uh, environment. One is actually mentoring one, giving him a record deal, giving him opportunities. I want people to see that, that it's not just a one-sided, singular generation conversation. It's a, we need to have, hip hop needs to have these broader conversations about who we are and where we're going. And I felt that now as a debut story would represent that. Definitely. When we were talking earlier, you mentioned uh, that this is actually way more in depth than like a behind the music was or anything. You said that. Back in the, did I, I say that? Just, oh. <laughs> you exposed <it. laughs> You exposed, you exposed it. It. I, I'm just saying that because for us who are, you know, hip hop nerds or just history of music nerds, this is something that they're going to want to tune into. So. Can you share some of the pockets, some of the secrets or things people wouldn't expect that you right. share in this film? Well, with, with, with Behind the Music, and I love Behind the Music, yeah. but it's a formula, right? Because you learn all the stuff, and then the music gets serious. And yeah. But then, <laughs> Bob's mother did something unbelievable. Yeah. She smoked crack, and he sold the crack to her, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's always that, like, in the 39th minute, that twist that goes bad. Where with this series, it's eight individual film, you know, a, a, eight individual documentaries made from individual directors who have their own perspective on the artist based on what they have access to. It's like, if we had three hip hop producers in here right now, and we blindfolded them, and they had the same five records to choose from to make a beat, and they've got their headphones on, when they take them off and they play the beat, it's not going to be the same thing. It's all, it's all in your approach and how you approach it. And going back to what I said about being a native and knowing the things that people aren't going to pick up on who typically make these things, the things that get missed, we didn't miss those things. And so I think what our job is, we try to be true to the culture. So you're watching it, you're ahead like, okay, yeah, they did that. That's right, that's right. And then if you're not ahead, you can learn these things. Yeah. and say, okay, I didn't know anything about that. Like when I did this film, Fresh Dress, it premiered at Sundance, and this woman came up to me afterwards, and she said, you know, I'm a 76-year-old white lady, and you know what? I'm not fresh. <laughs> right? And she's, and she's looking, she's like, I never knew what this meant yeah. to people. You know? Mm -hmm. And so I was able to tell a story that was engaging and interesting. You learned about Dapper Dan. You learn about all these people who are influential inside of the culture, but then someone outside of the culture learned that as well. So to me, that is my job as a filmmaker who works very heavily in this world. Like, I want it to be a true representation of who we are, and I want people to be able to come away learning something without what we do being bastardized somehow. As an executive producer of the whole series, was there a certain artist that you became a bigger fan of or something sparked you? Like go deeper into their catalog. Well, I got to be honest. I'm not. I'm not like. Believe it or not, I'm not Mr. Hip Hop. Oh, okay. In that, I don't necessarily listen to hip hop every day. I can go weeks without listening to hip hop, but I never have to listen to hip hop again because I know where it comes from. I'm. I am a product of that, right? And so, new hip hop, for me, I tell people all the time, it's about references. Like the cartoons that you grew up on aren't mine, yeah. right? So. Some kid who's 15 can listen to Ghostface Killer, who I think is one of the greatest, and not even, un it's like he's speaking a different language. Who, what? You don't really know. So hip hop now isn't for me, and that's not a bad thing. It should be for the kids who are doing it now. But in terms of like, you know, uh, Logic, honestly, I didn't know much about Logic at all. What, found, what I found interesting was his story about being biracial, about all the stuff that he overcame about identity. That's why when I learned about him, I brought him to the table and I said, we have to do logic because he has a story that is deeply rooted in identity and what hip hop has done for myself and so many people who struggle with identity, it's given them an identity. So here's a kid who's like, you know, he doesn't know if he's black or white. And you look at our poster, he actually looks more like a brother than he typically does, whatever that means. <laughs> but I'm saying, here, here's a guy who, just on the strength of his appearance, He's having issues because people are judging him. Oh, you're not black, you're not white, right? And here he finds hip hop and it gives him this cape. He becomes like a super, you can become your own superhero 
He rewrites his story. So for me, that's what I'm looking for. So I don't even ever have to live. If, if I know a few things about who you are and where you're from, that's all I need to know. I don't even ever have to listen to your music. A Boogie with the Hoodie, he's from the Bronx. You know, I know where he's from. I know what he's up against. And so having a, a, a sense of what his music's like and where he comes from and being able to see, like, all right, he's a young guy with rolling like iHeartRadio I with, like, mad people, right? <laughs> Nas doesn't roll like that anymore. Yeah. And so in, in the bringing back to the Nas episode, there's a conversation where they have, they're having a conversation, and Dave was like, yeah, tell me what it was like in those early days. I know you were rolling with 100 dudes, so what was that like? And then Nas gives you this, like, which you've never seen anywhere before, like a seasoned artist just explaining, like, yo, at a certain point, you got to say, I love you from afar because it's going to get in the way of your business. And that is not only applicable to rappers. How many basketball, football players, anyone from the inner city who finds a success, who feels like I've got to do for my entire community. So you have guys who have their whole neighborhood on their backs. And a lot of them don't make it out. They make it out, whole neighborhoods on their back. They're spending all this money, and then they're broke. The fact that Nas was able, Nas made an amazing album, Illmatic. Right? I go to France, I'm, I'm, people are playing it in the store. Right? It changed the world. This is a guy I went to junior high with. Right? But I know where he came from, and I knew maybe 40 of the 100 dudes who were on his back, that he felt a sense of responsibility, who felt that he owed them something. So that kernel of information coming from Nas to a Davies is powerful. Seeing a boogie with the hoodie in the hood giving out hundreds out of the back seat of his car to kids reaching in his car. I've seen that before. I interviewed Juvenile in, in, in 98, driving through the hoods in New Orleans. I'm from New York. Like people complain about the project. I'm like projects in New York are condos compared to Magnolia and what people in New Orleans are living in. And I'm in a Hummer with Juvenile and he's handing out hundreds. I've seen it before. All these things and that's why this sort of intergenerational conversation is important, young rapper. Like, it happened before. You don't have to like what the old guys did. Old guys don't have to like what the little guy, the new guys did. But like, let's have a conversation so we don't make the same mistakes, so we can improve. You know what I mean? So yeah, you can bring your entire hood if you work it the right way. Definitely. Sasha, we appreciate your time. The gems, if we had more time, we would stay here all day. Well, if I don't give them to you, you guys would rob me. Uh, well, <laughs> it is, it is a mafia. Run the jewels, you guys. <laughs> run the jewels. Run the it, is, it is a mafia situation. Yeah. But from South by Southwest 2018, it's Ashley Young and DJ Hell Yellow from iHeartRadio. Make sure you check out Rapture on Netflix.